so 14 inspectors, four from Ofsted, three with a, uh, a children's social care safeguarding focus and one with an education focus. So the education inspector is actually only on site for two days and spends most of their time outside in schools. There's four inspectors for the police, so MHIC, uh, Fire and Rescue Service Inspector, so they have four, four from the CQC and two from HMIP with a focus on the youth offending team. Um, we're a relatively small city and so you've got huge crowds of inspectors roaming around certainly the civic centre but also the wider city so it's, um, it's a lot of inspectors uh, and in fact we didn't book rooms big enough for the inspectors and ourselves so we had kind of 30 piled into rooms of a uh, big enough for 15. Um, so it's a, it's a very large inspection in terms of the numbers of inspectors that you're talking about. As always, when you're dealing with inspections, you have to remember they don't really know each other, um, and, and you often get that with Ofsted, but actually you certainly got that with this, where they, they'd met for the first time uh, on the morning that they arrived in Portsmouth. So um, I have to say, it, it, I was quite impressed at how coordinated they were, and I'll come back to that, that point later. Um, I've been involved in multi-inspectorate inspections before where it was a little bit chaotic. Um, I, I wouldn't describe that um, for this inspection team, but I'll come back to that point later. Um, the, the best way, in terms of how I would describe the inspection, the best way that I kind of came up with describing this is, is, is deep and wide. So if you compare it to a child protection inspection, if any of you have been involved in those, that, that's what I would call a very deep inspection in terms of the numbers of children they will look at, numbers of cases they'll look at, and in, at, at quite incredible depth. So certainly for, for, for us, when we had our ILAX inspection, you know, you're looking at 250 cases over a very short period of time. Um, they do go into absolutely minute detail around particularly seven deep dive children as they call them and we'll come back to that later so although it's not quite a, uh, the scale of numbers of children and cases that they look into uh, they do go into extraordinary detail around a handful of children and their families um, the, the wide bit is that it will be as wide as an SEND inspection, in fact I'll say wider, so uh, it, is, it is an area inspection in the same way, it's not a service inspection, but it's an area inspection, so you're, you're dealing with a lot of partners and, and inspectors out and about in hospitals, GP practices, schools, uh, CAM services, yacht services. Um, we lost a couple of inspectors at one point <laughs> somewhere across the city. Uh, so they're roaming wild across the city, um, talking to a lot of partners, uh, sometimes about individual children, sometimes about strategy and services. Um, so it, it, it's what I describe as deep and wide inspection. The, the, the other dimension is what I, it's kind of two inspections in one. Um, so you're, you're essentially working to two inspection frameworks. So the, the, the one is the standard JTI inspection criteria, the 22 inspection criteria for the uh, for the inspection of front door. I'll come back to the front door uh, question in a minute. Um, so that's that's been in place on on various inspectors' websites for quite some time now. It should be relatively. If you're not familiar with that, then do, do whatever the JTI theme. You'll, you you need to get yourself familiar with that standard framework. And then there's the mental health theme, which we're talking about today. So in that particular framework, there's, there's 19 criteria. So you, they're essentially conducting two inspections at the same time. Um, and those judgment criteria are kind of pulled into question, sometimes at the same time during the same conversation in the same focus group. So being aware of all those judgment criteria is really important. In, in terms of the kind of... Uh, 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 the two-week preparation. So there's kind of three aspects of this that I'll cover. The, uh, the first is the multi-inspectorate coordination. Our, our lead inspector from Ofsted was very good in, uh, in terms of coordinating all the inspectors. Um, in fact, he's been with Porter before a long time ago, um, so knew the city reasonably well. Um, I was involved in daily, sometimes hourly conversations in the two weeks leading up to the lead inspector, often about some of the kind of granular uh, practical details of car parking and those kind of uh, things. But but actually, one of the things that they try to model as a set of inspectorates is that they have a lead contact in each of the CQC, the local authority, the police and the youth offending team. And that proved a nightmare because um, sometimes what was happening is the information was being asked for from the CQC that actually needed to be with the yacht or, uh, or the police when it needed to be elsewhere. So uh, we, we quickly negotiated with the lead inspector that actually any request for information would come directly from him to me and then I would coordinate the um, colleagues from the other partner agencies in Portsmouth. Now, uh, we really recognise that's, that's quite 
it's easier in a small city and we've got a coterminous CCG and local authority. So some of you will be from areas where you've got a number of CCGs across one local authority patch or vice versa. Um, um, so that that would be more complex for some of the for some of the large counties in particular. Uh, it worked well for us because we know each other well in the small city and we've got co-terminosity in, including with local uh, with uh, neighborhood policing areas. So that helped enormously. So um, I would absolutely recommend that the lead inspector is your kind of single point of contact for all the inspectorates because otherwise it can get incredibly confusing. Um, had to have a number of challenging conversations with the lead inspector in the, in, the, in the lead up to it about really defining the key lines of the inquiry quite early on, um, which we always do when we have inspections in Portsmouth so that we can begin to get clear what the kind of boundaries of the conversations are and what evidence is needed. Um, and so that, that took a, it took a while to get that out. So by the time they arrived in field work week, uh, we did have a clearer sense of the areas that they were looking at following their their pre work, their reading around uh, previous inspections of all the uh, all the services in the city, and, and obviously the published national data, particularly on safeguarding. Um, the, the the second aspect of the two week preparation is what the inspectors need and and my lord they're needy they're, they're, there's a lot of stuff to get done in that two weeks so it's the standard stuff of timetabling uh, unlike child protection where there's not a lot of timetabling to do they they land and they they seek to talk to social workers the minute they land um, with this there's a it's a bit like the SEND inspection there's a lot of timetabling and a very complex dynamic timetabling to do lots of multi agency focus groups and and, and a few one to ones. There's the Annex A data, which is the data that's driven by the social care data set to begin with and then matched with the CAMS data set uh, in order to set up for it's fundamentally for them to select their seven deep dive children. And there's quite a lot of fuss. In Portsmouth, it was quite tricky for them to, uh, uh, we have a quite, uh, not a particularly di ethnically diverse population, for example, and they're very keen to have a, uh, a young person from an ethnic minority background. Uh, it took them a long time to find one of those. Uh, so there was a bit of a um, hullabaloo around sampling, uh, and it took us a while to get out of the um, inspectorates which seven children they were looking at. The quicker we know which seven children they're looking at, the quicker we can do the audit work. Um, there's a lot of documents, a huge number of documents. There's 36 categories of documents, and for us that turned into 120 documents, some of which are really easy, like minutes of meetings, for example. Some are incredibly complex, and some suddenly needed a quick bit of refreshing, and we did a lot of checking and rechecking of those. Um, then there's the multi-agency audit of seven deep dive children. So um, one, one of the lessons, and I'll, I'll come back to this point later, is making sure that your multi-agency audit practice that you may have or hopefully have for your safeguarding partnership, you have to be able to enact that fairly quickly. Um, the depth of audit work on a single agency and multi-agency work can't be underestimated and, that, um, and they will deep dive into those children um, during the field work week, but we knew those children inside out by the time we got to the end of the preparation week because of the single agency and multi-agency audit. What, what they require from you before they land in, in, in your area is an overview report on the findings, a huge long list of the key paperwork, the assessments, the plans, the treatment plans for the individual children, um, and then the individual single agency audits of each of those children. So you're uploading onto their system somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 documents just for each one of those seven children. Uh, they'll also require a list of your commission services, particularly mental health services. So there's a lot of demand on getting information to um, the inspectors from across the system, not just from the local authority, but from across all partners. Um, moving on to F, in terms of what we did behind the scenes, so um, we had a multi-agency core team, kind of an inspection team, if you like, which we, we met every day with senior managers, very senior manager from social care, police, yacht, CAMS. Uh, the safeguarding partnership is a really key part of this story, the CCG and education services. So we had 12 sufficiently senior colleagues that could uh, respond very quickly to either inspection request, inspectorate request, or, or request from ourselves on information that was needed. We had a very detailed project plan. What we did do, and I would highly recommend you do this beforehand, because we, we um, I'll come back to the point around um, whether we actually prepared for this well enough up front. We probably didn't. Um, but in that two-week period, we did quick and dirty self-assessments across both those inspection frameworks, so the front doors and, and uh, the mental health criteria, and that gave us a good indication around what we felt to be our potentially vulnerable points and things, and, and also our strengths and things that we could promote. Um, we had a risk register with some mitigation. Um, 
we, we gave advice and guidance out as we always do with our social workers um, around inspection and the kind of do's and don'ts of inspection. Um, some colleagues that were being interviewed by inspectors have never been interviewed by inspectors before and certainly have never been interviewed by inspectors before about case work and individual work around children and for some colleagues particularly in NHS and police and school services that was quite tricky our social workers are kind of used to that kind of work but others aren't um, we set up an Annex C I'll come back to Annex C later but we did set up an Annex e, uh, C uh, rapid response team but I'll explain a bit more about that in a second the other thing that we did is a long list of our time, what we called our time to shine so those things we're proud of those things that we want to make sure inspectors hear about um, if you do, if you're involved in child protection um, inspections, it's quite hard to put good stuff in front of inspectors because they're absolutely knee deep in individual cases. In the SEND inspection and this inspection, there is a lot of opportunity to push your good practice and your good strategy work and communication. So we had um, accounted uh, um, in preparation for this. I counted the number of colleagues in the city that met inspectors. It's over 250. Um, and we made sure that we communicated with everybody that was involved in, in the inspection. Um, it's certainly about creating that kind of team Portsmouth thing for us, about making sure we put our best foot forward um, and kind of building that, that kind of community in terms of people um, going that extra mile to make sure we had a good inspection outcome. So that's the kind of the structure of the inspection. Are there any questions from colleagues before we move on to the actual field work week? Thanks, Hayden. Colleagues, any questions that you'd like to raise? You can also be emailing Hayley questions as we go, if that's helpful. Okay. Um, Hayden, it's you're very clear and very concise. Let's continue. Okay. Um, so if we go into section 3.2, um, managing the inspector briefing and information flow. So a few words about the inspection team. Um, really good. Very impressive. Absolutely knew, knew their stuff. They were they were reasonably well organised. You often get this with inspections that the they ask for information they've already had because there's a deluge of information that they receive in the preparation two weeks. But actually that wasn't anywhere near as bad as I've experienced in the past. Um, the lead inspector was superb. Um, they really do know their, their work and they know their stuff. They were very impressive. Their knowledge of the system uh, was really good, and but they, they were incredibly appreciative of the complexity that we're working with around individual uh, cases, around uh, uh, stresses and strains in the funding uh, of, of services. They, they were very, very realistic about what could be achieved, um, uh, uh, particularly with individual children. Um, they... Um, it's interesting that they how child focused they were um, and again so they were trying to kind of balance off strategy with um, individual children there I probably didn't put this in the bullet point but it's really worth uh, the, the question that they kept coming back to all the time which is not an unhelpful question is so what so you've done this strategy or you've commissioned this service or you've redesigned the pathway so what what's been the impact and that did challenge us and it, it, it's it's probably something that should challenge us on a daily basis but asking about impact was really interesting and useful and we had to really pull out information case studies data to show an evidence impact um, on particular strategies or pieces of work that we've been doing uh, what they did have which i was very impressed at was a really good understanding of mental health as a system uh, we, had, we had a slightly different experience in the SEND inspection where the understanding of mental health was about Sonia's service, it was about CAMS, not understanding the work in schools or early year settings or in the police or in the hospital. Um, they had a really good understanding of mental health being everybody's business um, and uh, the framework helped them do that, but professionally I think they really got it that actually uh, not only does Portsmouth sort of consider mental health to be everybody's business, but that they had an expectation that all services were playing their part in meeting obviously the safeguarding needs, but more specifically the mental health needs of children. We were very impressed with that. Uh, I'd actually say it's not quite the deficit model that we've experienced before. I think they, they were really looking for the good news and they were really um, keen for uh, to hear about things that were going well in the city. Um, it didn't feel like they were always looking for problems. That's kind of the job of inspectors is to find problems, but actually didn't feel quite the deficit model that I've experienced before. Um, the keeping in touch meetings are really important. They are daily. Um, we asked for two on the final Thursday because we wanted to hear back uh, in specific detail about some uh, work they were doing on the deep dive children. Um, so they were quite open for that. We did control who was present at each kit meeting, although we did make a mistake, and I'll come back to that later. Um, 
They were uh, incredibly detailed. The feedback was incredibly detailed. Um, do bring lots of coffee and write fast. Um, myself and Alison were scribbling away, weren't we? Um, uh, as the inspectors read out, really quite specific child level detail of their findings. And it was quite hard for us, all 10 of us in the room, to kind of capture the detail of this. That was quite extraordinary. Far more than I've experienced before. Um, not unhelpful, but incredibly detailed. Um, Right, section C, the individual children concern is really important. There's essentially two levels. If you've been involved in child protection um, uh, inspections, you, you'll, you'll know this. Um, two levels of concern. So there are children that they will say they will require more information, and there are children that they will formally launch a process, which I think in the ILAX inspection is called Annex B, but for here it was Annex C, um, by which inspectors raise concern for the safety of a child. So they, they did it once uh, for us. If I compare that to our ILAX inspection, we, we had 12 raised to us formally. We still got a good, so it's not necessarily a level of concern around the whole system. It's they, they want to know if this child is safe uh, um, or what, you, what you're doing about it. What we had set up, because we learned this from um, previous inspections in our 2014 safeguard inspection, we got this slightly wrong. Um, we didn't respond quick enough to the concerns raised by inspectors, so I would highly recommend you have what, what I called a, a crack team of rapid responders. So we had, in fact, Sonia was one of those. Um, uh, so a senior uh, CAMS worker, an EP, a CCG lead, social worker and police officer, so that if they raise a concern for a child, you can get a written response to the inspectors within 24 hours, because it closes down um, uh, a, a, a potentially broader set of key inquiry. So the quicker you can close that down or, or put your hands up and say, yep, yeah, we've got this wrong around this child and this is what we're going to go and do about it. Um, don't allow those those children to fester, if that makes sense, or those concerns to fester, should I say. Um, we, we were at pains to give them time to shine, is what we called our, you know, that's the language we use for our good practice. We had 68 that we prepared in that fortnight beforehand of things we wanted inspectors to hear. Um, and we made sure that every focus group lead knew which piece of good practice information they needed inspectors to hear. And that worked really, really well. Um, and again, inspectors were asking for that and we were absolutely primed and ready to give those good practice examples and they were very receptive to that. Um, However, be cautious about bombarding them with information. Uh, try to tailor it to their key lines of inquiry. That's why it's important to negotiate with the inspectors beforehand about what they're looking at. Where's their, where's their worry points for Portsmouth in our case? Um, and we made sure that our good practice examples were tailored to where their concerns were based on their uh, pre-work before they got here. Um, what they asked of us, um, they actually only asked for an additional 19 pieces of information. Now, that, 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 that's not been my experience before, where there's been dozens. So they were very good at using what we'd already given them, but um, we had to make sure we responded very quickly uh, to additional requests. Um, but we, we're very clear when we manage inspections that we centrally manage that. We don't allow anybody in a focus group to give information to an inspector unless we've checked its accuracy, not because we want to doctor it, but because we want to check its accuracy. We've had experience before of misinformation going to inspectors and it, it sets all sorts of weird hairs running. Um, uh, so we told inspectors that from day one, we said we're not going to allow any, any of our colleagues across the system to give you any information until we've checked it essentially for its veracity and uh, accuracy. And of course, we had feedback loops. So we knew all the time essentially what the issues were that were coming up in focus groups. And that helped us address the issues in the kit <coughs> once they fought in the keeping in touch meetings formally once they presented those. Um, one of, the, one of the things that we got slightly wrong was involving the hospital from an early point. And in fact, we did pull the hospital into a keeping in touch meeting because of concern they had at the hospital that turned out not to be a big concern at all. There was no way me and Alison or Sonia could have answered that question or the police officers. We needed that the hospital there to do that. In fact, the CCG didn't know the detail, uh, nor should they actually. So we pulled the hospital in and they gave a, a, a brilliant response to the concern that was raised. Um, the, one of the mistakes I think we made was not involving the hospital in the key in the core team to begin with. I'll pause at that point for any questions or people can keep them to the end. I'm happy to do whatever. Thanks, Hayden. Um, so colleagues, let's um, go area by area just to see if we've got any questions so far. So Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Southampton, any questions? Not from me, thank you. Uh, let's move to Berkshire, Berkshire East and Berkshire West. Any questions? 
Um, would would Hayden be willing to share any of his documents? Like, I'm just thinking of the thing that he did, which was the, the, get the there was over 200 and summit staff, and they did the, the kind of do's and don'ts. Would he be willing to share share course, that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We wrote it years ago for our social workers. Um, because you know, some some sort of young newbie social workers faced with an inspector can be a very daunting exercise. Um, so yeah, we've got some do's and don'ts. I'm really happy to share share that. It's fa fairly standard stuff, but yeah, more than happy to share that. Yeah, thanks, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Um, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, any questions? Hi, yeah, it's Lila here. Uh, I was just wondering when you say uh, hospital, was, was that an acute hospital, paediatric, or were you meaning psychiatric inpatient? Oh, it's all in one here. So, yeah, it's an acute hospital. Okay. So, yeah, just the just Portsmouth, 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 yeah, Portsmouth Hospital Trust. And of course, um, our hospital covers um, only a third of their work comes from Portsmouth and two thirds is South East Hampshire. So they, they will be subject, um, any multi-agency inspection that happens in Hampshire, they'll obviously be involved in that too. Um, so, yeah, and we've done a lot of work with the hospital around um, pediatric and psychiatric liaison, so, and they were able to tell some good stories about um, the commissioning work there. Just, just to, Alison here, just to emphasise, um, the emergency department at your hospital, or hospital plural, uh, will be part of the uh, front door that this inspection looks at. So front door needs to be seen very broadly. You're not talking about just MASH. You're talking about the custard suite um, for the police. You're talking about the hospital. Um, and we did at one point suggest they should go down to the port and buy UM entry. <laughs> get that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Great. Thank Lovely, thank you. And um, Dorset, Sussex, any uh, and, and colleagues in the north, any questions? Okay, Hayden, one of the things um, that I know we're working with some areas on is the development of the multi-professional um, audit framework um, and, and the value, the importance of being able to mobilise that really quickly. Yes. Are you willing to share some examples, uh, not just of uh, uh, the frameworks, but also how you've captured learning from those audits um, so that you can demonstrate uh, a multi-professional system that's learning together to improve the mental health of children? Would that be possible? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, and what, what we lent on more than anything was how we do it in in um, this Ports of Safeguarding partnership, as it is now, Ports of Safeguarding Board, your old LSCB. Yeah. We've had multi agency yeah. audit practice for quite some time. Uh, and it, it was a really interesting reminder that actually the power of multi agency audit, when you're not only talking about safeguarding, we've been reflecting around multi agency audit for our looked after children, for our care leavers, for CAMS children that are not where there isn't a safeguarding concern. So it, it, the, the power of learning through that multi agency audit and seeing different lenses from education, health, police, is, is incredibly powerful. But I can absolutely share with you our methodology that we use in the Safeguarding Partnership. That'd be brilliant. Thank you. OK, so shall we carry on? Yep. Yep. OK. 3.3, um, Inspector Engagement. Um, so just, just to let you know how they structure themselves, because um, I wish I'd known this before they arrived. Um, so how the inspectors structure themselves, essentially they've got three multi-inspectorate pods. In other words, there's somebody from the Ofsted, CQC, uh, HMIC, and uh, um, uh, HMIP in each of their pods. Um, and they divide themselves into a, a front door pod, a deep dive pod, and a leadership and management. So if I just go in, into those in a little bit more detail. So the front door, Alison's made this point. It's a really important point, this. Don't think of your front door as your MASH or your, or your um, uh, assessment team for children's social care. It's, it's much, much broader than that. So they would consider a surgery, a GP primary uh, care as a front door. So when they went to visit our two GPs or two of our GPs around individual children, they consider that surgery a front door and they analyze it and understand it in terms of any safeguarding or mental health concerns for a child at that surgery. Ditto the police custody suite, ditto the CAMS front door, uh, where there are no safeguarding you know, concerns for a child, but clearly somebody's made a referral into what imports if we call our single point of access for CAMS. Um, so, and, and, and as Alison says, A&E. So front door has a very, very broad meaning, which um, when we were asking colleagues to do a self-assessment against the judgment criteria for a front door, that was a quirky one. 
because it meant that you were applying what was kind of traditionally written for a mash into the into the function of a police custody suite, for example. So that was really helpful and, and, and useful. <clears throat> um, they did track cases through the front door, but it wasn't huge numbers. So unlike a safeguard inspection where there will be hundreds of ch uh, children that they'll sample, um, it's more in the dozens. It's around about 30 or 40 that they tracked through the, through the MASH front door, but there were an additional group of children that they would track through the police custody suite or the CAMS front door. The, the second bit is the deep dive pod. So this is the seven children. <clears throat> So you've got four inspectors for four days looking at four children. So you can imagine the level of granularity that they go into. Um, so they literally followed um, those children's cases all around the city. So they visited their schools, they visited their GP practices, uh, they visited the police, um, they visited the yacht. Um, of those seven children, six were known to CAMS. Uh, all seven were known to social care at some point. That's how they got it from the Annex A list. Um, one of them was get down to early help, so we had the early help service involved. Now, for five of the seven children, they held individual meetings with each of the individual practitioners involved in the team around the child. So they started with the social worker, and then they went to the CAMS worker, and then they went to the school nurse, and, and, and they're triangulating around the quality of assessment and planning and safety and mental health, uh, meeting the mental health needs of those children. They're triangulating it across the team around the child but individually. For two of the seven children, they had a multi-agency focus group, so they brought all the professionals in that were known to this child. Um, uh, it was child number three and child number four. Uh, you'll get used to that language if you have a genotype, numbering our children. Um, they, it was really interesting that the, the, the lead inspector for education was only with us for two days and he was only involved in deep dive uh, cases. Um, and so he went to go and talk to the individual schools about those children. We, we made sure that a colleague of ours from the education service who knows those schools inside out was able to kind of broker that conversation uh, and give a bit of a briefing to our school colleagues around this strange inspector that was turning up, but not to inspect the school, but actually to inspect the mental health and safeguarding system. Um, they want to, the inspectors want to speak to the children and families themselves. We, we were quite taken aback that all seven of our children and families wanted to, certainly seven of our families and two of our children, wanted to talk to inspectors. In the end, only six made it. One of them pulled out for um, a different challenge in the family that was happening that day. Um, and we had to make sure that we got a safe, comfortable space for those families to join. Uh, a couple of them were home visits, so the inspectors went out to the families' homes which is very interesting and very helpful. Um, lastly, the, the leadership and management pod. So there's a, a, a multi-inspector. Uh, the lead inspector from Ofsted joins this pod, and this is where your focus groups are in particular for the safeguarding partnership, the health and wellbeing board, uh, CCG commissioners, um, and other focus groups. I think there was about seven focus groups in all, particularly focusing on leadership and management and doing all that triangulation bit with what they're seeing in the front line. Um, every one of our focus groups had a Portsmouth lead. Um, I was the lead for two of them. I tried to chair it, but sometimes the inspector would take over. <laughs> Other times they'd kind of sit back and uh, let us lead the conversation. Um, there was uh, quite a lot of late night phone calls in Portsmouth to, for, for those people involved in the focus groups to make sure the kind of tonal message was, was tidy and clear that, that within those focus groups, they were talking about the main key things we want to get across about in Portsmouth. We do a lot of work on restorative practice, for example, uh, the, the, our relationships and, 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 and partnerships, and of course, our, our social and emotional mental health strategy. So ensuring that but colleagues knew what the 11 objectives were of the SMH strategy. Those kind of things were really important to make sure that came out in a joined up way in the focus groups, uh, which we think it did. So basically they, they structure themselves into these three pods um, and they don't bring their finding together until they have their own team meeting in, on, on Thursday and the Friday, where they take all the intelligence across those three pods to build up a narrative around the city. I'll pause there. Thanks, Hayden. That's really helpful. Um, we'll go by area again, um, and we'll reverse it this time. Uh, so let's let's start with Dorset, Sussex, and the North. Any questions? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna. Sorry, I just saw a light on my screen, so I'm just checking. That's not somebody wanting to ask. Hello. Go ahead. 
Okay, we'll come back to you because we can't hear you. I'll just check you're not on mute. Okay, uh, we'll keep going. Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire, any questions? No, none for me. Thank you. Berkshire West, Berkshire East, any questions? None from Berkshire no. West. No, I none, have, none from Berkshire East. I have a question from Sandy from Berkshire West. When you were when you were talking about the front door uh, bit and the broad breadth of that, does that yep. affect how you collect information at Annex A, or is that is that just back to standard MASH data only? It's, it's a really good question. No, it, it's um, I can't remember quite the numbers, but it's list six and list seven from memory um, from the Annex A data set. So they essentially go back to the, um, I think it's the contacts into the MASH and uh, contacts uh, and the open cases in children's social care. So it's a really good question. That, what they didn't do is take the sample. They only use that list of data to select the seven children. That's really what they do with it. Quite why they need all that data to select seven children is another question. But no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It's a good question. They didn't use police custody data to identify uh, children that they may want to look at in, in the deep dive seven. Andy, is that okay? Anything else from your perspective? Okay, no. Hayden. <laughs> okay, uh, Hampshire, Isle of Wight, Southampton. Any I questions? had a question from a public health perspective. Mm. When the when you mentioned school nursing and they're trying to triangulate between the different professions, um, are they interested in talking to uh, commissioners or is it more uh, service delivery? That's a good question. Or a bit of both. Um, it's a bit of both. I, I, um, in, they, would, they would treat commissioning in the leadership and management theme. Um, okay. So there was all the way up to the health and wellbeing board and down through how we do commissioning um, with, across the local authority and the CCG in particular. Um, they would tend to engage with service managers more in the... Uh, there was a specific visit to CAMS. They spent a day with Sonia and her team. Uh, obviously, given that given the theme, but they tended to deal with, deal with, engage with services, commission services through the deep dive cases and the team around the child. So there weren't any focus groups specifically. There were visits, but there weren't any focus groups specifically around um, service managers. Does that make sense? They were more interested in your commissioning and how that links to your mental health and your safeguarding strategies. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Hayden, um, part of the skill of this is preparing frontline staff in very different professional settings to be able to engage with mm -hmm. inspectors. Um, and as you've uh, signalled quite clearly, our uh, social work work workforce is quite adept at this. They have a lot of this kind of activity going on. And we have other yeah. staff, um, educational psychology might be a good example, that are, are regularly contributing to, to inspections of this nature. But when you're starting to brief staff as broad as those working in A&E, those working in police settings, those working in schools who are used to a different kind of inspectorate uh, interaction. What, what are your top tips on how to do that effectively? That's a really good question. Um, have we had more preparation time? And I'll come back to that point a little bit in terms of the lessons. Um, so one of the things that we kind of found was that, as you rightly say, some professions are more used to having, uh, so frontline professions are more used to having contact with inspectors than others. Um, and certainly social work is very, very kind of clear on that. Uh, you, what we found is that we had some uh, uh, quite long conversations at, um, late at night with some police officers that had never actually met an inspector before. Yeah. Um, and so we had to uh, spend quite a bit of time briefing and debriefing people who were going to be involved in focus groups around individual children or receive a visit. Um, and even our schools, you think you, you would think, wouldn't you, schools are used to dealing with inspectors. They absolutely are. What they weren't used to was this kind of forensic, in-depth conversation about an individual child. Mm -hmm. 
which doesn't really, it happens a little bit more in the way that um, uh, Section 5 and Section 8 inspections are done in schools now because of their strong focus on inclusion and, and safeguarding. Um, but they weren't, you know, the Ofsted inspections were in schools would, would normally be about your kind of teaching and learning, your strategy and your data and you're observing the quality of teaching. Um, they weren't used to this kind of forensic conversation around um, the early help assessment of a particular child or the relationship with a social worker, for example. So um, I, think, I think a lesson would be trying to make sure that we prepare um, using some of the advice and guidance that we've used in social care over the years for frontline practitioners in other arenas. Absolutely. Just, just one thing to add, uh, it's Alison here. Um, I think overall in these inspections, uh, you get credit for being willing uh, and apparently willing to learn and to engage. Uh, and so really we would say to frontline staff, enjoy this interaction about the work that you love. You know, talk with the passion that you feel about the work you're doing every day. Um, have a, a, a dialogue, a conversation with the inspection sector. Don't see it as a, a test or exam. You know, just actually talk about what you really love doing and what you've done with this child so that um, they can get a really good sense of your professionalism and commitment and, and you know, just really make something of it rather than you know, be incredibly anxious. That's so helpful. Sonia, could we ask you as well to comment on what it felt like from a CAMS perspective? Um, because this is an entirely different focus, isn't it, compared to the other inspections we're used to? We had a CQC inspector who was very helpful, very engaged, seemed to understand mental health very well, which was helpful. One of the recommendations from our more senior manager was to do a PowerPoint presentation. And that proved to be really helpful because it focused the conversations. She was able to ask questions as we went along um, and talked about different aspects of our service. So by the time we finished the PowerPoint presentation, she had most of the information that she needed. And I think as Alison was saying, one of the things we had sort of very open conversations about our challenges as well as what we did well. And some of the challenges for a lot of CAM services are wait times, but she was very impressed by our innovation around wait times that we were wanting to do things around the wait times that we didn't want, want, want long wait times and she was kind of very impressed by that um, and our motivation and passion to do something different and to have an accessible service. So I think and also because we do, we've, we have done CQC inspections before and it kind of felt very similar to that really, so not so different and we're also part of the quality network for community CAMs and that's a, a yearly peer review and accreditation visits which again, staff are quite used to talking to people and, and, and um, sh uh, as um, Hayden said, a time to shine. So really promoting what we do well. And it was a real opportunity for staff to do that. Thank you, Sonia. Um, and you've got lots of excellent innovation to share in Portsmouth. Alison, could we, um, before we move on to the next slide, could we ask you a question from the perspective of Director of Children's Services, um, how this felt from your perspective and how you worked with partnership leaders well, I was part of the uh, group that met every night uh, to the experience of inspection and do the coordination. Uh, I also had the lead for the health and well-being focus group and the safeguarding board focus group. So I'd had discussions with everybody who was going to be part of those groups uh, ahead of the actual inspection interview or discussion you know, so we, we we got together on a telephone conference in each case and uh, and checked off all the things that we needed to get across um, checked that everybody was on the same page in terms of uh, understanding strategy which um, I mean one of the benefits of being a small city with coterminous boundaries as Hayden says is actually wasn't too difficult to do because th this is you know these are people that we meet uh, frequently and uh, share a lot of work with all the time. So I didn't find that difficult. I had my own one-to-one -one interview with the lead inspector, which was interesting because actually normally you don't get those. They, they test yes. the leadership through the impact, which is right and proper, um, but you do. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a really good experience. And, and, and it can also, even though you think you know what's going on, my goodness, you have an exercise like this and all sorts of things that are really <laughs> good. You didn't know what's going on. It's really it's mm. a very good learning experience for everyone, actually. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Hayden, we've interrupted you. Please keep going. That's okay. 
OK, this is the last bit, um, and then we'll open for any more questions. There's just a few lessons. I, I divided this into what we wish we'd known and, and the section on kind of, we kind of knew this, but it's worth reminding ourselves and also reminding colleagues across the, across the system. So uh, the first thing, uh, we chose deliberately not to prepare for the j and I think that was probably a mistake. So I remember sitting in this very seat that I am now in Alison's office and saying, we don't need to prepare, we'll be fine. Um, we're not, <laughs> not going to get one of these. And then, and then I get a phone call from Alison three weeks later saying, I've just had a call from Ofsted. Um, so it's probably a bit of a mistake. Um, we are a small authority, so preparing for things that aren't that might or might not happen is it, 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 a bit of a challenge for us. So if you do have experts in your systems that are good at preparing and doing that self-assessment and all those kind of things, I, I, you probably ought to do it. And I wish we had. Um, second, I, I, I do wish we'd done a self-assessment against the framework, those, both those frameworks, particularly the, the standard front door one. And it, it took me a while to remember that that kind of existed, actually. And there's no harm in ever doing a self-assessment against your front doors, um, just for mental health, but more broadly. And, and again, the mental health, I always say this about inspection frameworks, um, they're in, you know, they define good practice and they usually put you right, certainly in child protection, you know, it absolutely defines what good social work looks like. So um, doing a self-assessment against the JTI framework is, is, is never a waste of time. I, I wish we'd followed our own advice really on that one. Um, number three, um, it's a huge document pack that they need and it's probably worth just having a quick look at that pack and having to think about whether you can readily lay your hands uh, on it. There was uh, a lot of work to check and recheck those documents. Um, we didn't really have the time to sit those documents alongside each other and say, do they, uh, do they, uh, do they triangulate to tell a sensible story? Um, each individual document was checked and they, they looked fine and there was any kind of googlies in there that were going to come back and bite us. But actually, we didn't have the time because we hadn't prepared beforehand to see are they at odds with each other. Uh, 2020 hindsight showed that a couple of them were, which wasn't unhelpful learning, but I wish we knew that before the inspectors arrived. Uh, number four, some of the work on mental health and the police came as more of a surprise to us who worked in the local authority and the council uh, and the CCG for a while. Um, I didn't even know that the police had a mental health strategy, and I wish I had. <laughs> um, so it goes back to Alison's point. There were some pleasant surprises. There was some really mature work. We know yeah. all about um, the police work on, on, on child protection. Uh, through the safeguarding partnership but we we were quite taken by pleasant surprise on some of the work they're doing on, on mental health and who knew there you go that was an interesting one for us um the i think i've made this point some of the health services and schools weren't used to the forensic deep dive on individual children's cases so so preparing colleagues for that level of uh ferocious in-depth conversations around individual children is, is, is no waste of time whatsoever um so I, I would absolutely advise areas to, to, you've all got safeguarding threshold documents. It's a requirement of your safeguarding partnership to publish those. You you probably want to sit those alongside your um, your criteria for your CAMS front door. Um, and certainly we know, me and Sonia talk about this a lot, is that children with, with a conduct disorder will challenge, because they're often the kids that get thrown between your CAMS front door and your safeguarding front door. And in fact, um, that launched a piece of work that we've done since on conduct disorder. Um, so taking a look at your your safeguarding thresholds and your mental health uh, thresholds, I think is a really good uh, way of spending a bit of time. Um, essentially, the safeguarding partnership is the one that really, uh, the practice around multi-entity audit is the one that we can do, we'll end up using in, in any JTI. Um, We've got a long tradition now. I think we've done about nine multi-agency audits over the last three years, and we're, we're getting pretty good at it. And so we had all the frameworks and the, the documents in place to be able to do that. So it's relatively straightforward for us. Um, so do go and talk to your safeguarding partnership business unit to see how they choose to do that. Um, ensuring that your like, this is an interesting one. Ensuring your safeguarding partnership knows the inspection outcomes of every partner. So we knew what HMIP had previously said about the police, Hampshire Police. Um, we knew inside and out um, the CQC for our for CAMS, um, and we knew obviously ourselves and the local authority in terms of child protection, but we didn't know about a recent CQC inspection of the hospital where there was a particular issue the CQC had been picked up, and we didn't we weren't able to kind of push back on that uh, without hospital colleagues around the table. As it turned out, it was no it was about a balcony weirdly enough. 
Um, but actually, we didn't know in, in, in the safeguarding partnership, and, and, and it's just a, a good reminder that your safeguarding partnership ought to, ought to have a bit of a clock on uh, inspections, particularly around safeguarding that happened in the area. Um, and again, I think I've made this point, the last bit, engage the hospital via the CCG. Now, this is in no way a criticism of uh, my, myself and Alison's colleagues in the CCG, but actually we, we, we needed to talk to the hospital directly and get them engaged in the inspection um, rather than work through the relationship between the CCG and, and the uh, hospital trust. Um, things that we were reminded of, um, last list, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, the two partnerships that are critical is your safeguarding partnership and your local mental health partnership. So we have a, an SEMH, a social and emotional mental health partnership, which myself and Sonia work through. Uh, and we've had that in place for only about a year and a half, actually. And had we not had that, we'd have been in a bit of trouble with this inspection. So we, we've got a published SEMH strategy and we were able to refer to that all the time to show that we'd clocked a range of issues that we were seeking to tackle. So your your local area mental health strategies is in, in, and, and your, your partnership is incredibly important here. Um, safeguarding partnerships are pretty mature, mental health partnerships less so. Um, Alison's made this point, uh, we're a small city, so senior managers know each other well. Um, it, it's, a, it's the maddest three weeks of my career, and I've been around for 25 years now, um, and, and thank God we know each other so well. If, if you're in a really big county, um, try to, you know, I'm sure you've got those strategic relationships, but they, they are tested to destruction during a, a crazy week like that. It, it just meant when we were able to ask colleagues for stuff, um, they responded really well, because we worked through that relationship. Um, when it was very helpful that Alison had a phone call with Milton Keynes, who who had been through this inspection framework, and one of the bits of advice that Alison picked up from Richard at DCS, um, he is still Richard, isn't it? No. Oh, is it somebody else at Milton Keynes? Yeah. Um, was a, a, a reminder to be really robust around your um, your audit, your multi entity audit. Um, you've really got to prove that you know what good looks like and you know that there is a strategic ambition for quality. So as it happens, we judged ourselves for all seven of those children as requires improvement. Mm -hmm. There were lots of good features, lots of good features, none of them were inadequate. Um, but it, it shows that we set the bar really high for how we expect agencies to work together around safeguarding and mental health. And that 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 just um, is really important to kind of avoid that potential accusation of complacency. Um, they did actually feedback that we were quite hard on ourselves, and that that's I'd rather hear that than actually you don't know what good looks like. Okay. Number four, um, inspectors expect frontline staff to know. Well, this is an interesting one, and Alison was talking about this in in, in a meeting recently. Um, it's interesting how inspectors kind of expect our frontline practitioners to know strategy, um, and we think that's probably a little bit unfair. Um, but they probably ought to be able to talk about things like quality assurance systems, particularly for child protection, uh, and our major kind of big feature, um, big ticket issues uh, or strategy. So for us, it would be restorative practice, uh, our work on trauma and how trauma informed and uh, we seek to be uh, around all our work with children, not just our looked after children. So making sure that frontline practitioners don't, can't necessarily read out what the strategy says, but have a broad sense of the kind of uh, strategic intentions to have in your local area around safeguarding and mental health. Uh, lastly, I think it is lastly, uh, communication, 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 just keeping people energised for a very, very hard three weeks and keeping people motivated and buying lots of, we've, we had lots of cakes bought for us by the police, that was very nice. Um, um, and just making people care about the inspection outcome. It's important to say the JTI is not graded judgment, so you can't all dance around a good or an outstanding judgment. It's a letter, like the send is. Um, you basically got across a threshold to have no immediate priority areas of improvement, and, we, and um, I'm sure we can probably tell colleagues we, we were delighted with our outcome, even though the letter's not published. Um, but getting people energised about wanting to have a good inspection outcome is really important because it, it pays dividends when you're asking at 11 o'clock at night for a bit of data. It rather helps if they care about the inspection outcome. I should say Hayden is utterly brilliant at these communications and they're always very entertaining. So people almost look forward to inspections in order to have <laughs> daily emails from Hayden. Um, <laughs> are very close to the line in um, terms of their... Um, <laughs> sensitivity but anyway <laughs> i just hope inspectors don't read them yeah, yeah. so that, 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 that's it that's it from us andrea if there's any questions really happy to take them
Thank you. you I mean, we just say thank you. You've shared so much and so clearly. We're so grateful for you taking the time because it does okay. make a difference to all of us um, wishing to prepare. Um, colleagues, um, opening up as broadly as we can. Any questions? Do you want me to go area by area? Is that easier? Uh, let's do the Hampshire Isle of Wight, Southampton uh, patch. Anyone there? Any questions? Berkshire East and Berkshire West, any questions? Andrea, Rachel Walker. Um, hi, Rachel. Hi. Um, can I just ask about specialised commissioning um, for mental health and whether or not that was part of the inspection in any way in terms of um, the pathway into and out of Tier 4 provision? Hi, Rachel. Um, hi. Uh, interestingly, not a lot. No. Um, now, I, I think it probably depends on which children they select in the deep dive sample. Right. Yeah. A huge proportion of this inspection is about that. They, they weren't. They didn't really ask us any questions in the commissioning. It's interesting, Rachel. Now I reflect on it. They didn't really ask us a lot about tier four commissioning. Um, so we didn't really talk about new models of care particularly. They, they didn't really talk about that. It was mentioned in the kind of system wide piece of work. They're they incredibly focused on the local area and, and less interested in what we were doing on that kind of Wessex footprint, which is interesting. Um, other than, obviously, we were talking about the work in Wessex about um, the kind of recruitment into the into the mental health workforce, and they could see that we were linked in there. But they were, um, had they chosen a child um, in the sample that had experienced Tier 4, then absolutely they would have kind of followed that child through into that system. And, and in fact, now I think about it, Rachel, I'm surprised they didn't apply that criteria when they looked at the seven children, but they didn't. Yeah. None of our seven had been through tier four. And actually that's quite a surprise now I think about it because they are some of the most challenging for partnership working and, you know, particularly discharge right. in section 117 and all that kind of work. Sure, but no, yeah. they, they, they didn't really go there. That's I, interesting. I, I think it's probably worth emphasizing that our experience was that the inspectors were um, taking a really broad approach to mental health. So, as we said in the SEND inspection, we had a CQC inspector who only wanted to talk to, to CAMS initially, and we had to force them to listen to us about what we were doing in schools. Um, mm. But in this inspection, they absolutely had a preventative lens. Yeah, they, they, they really were um, very interested in all aspects of what we were doing mm. in terms of promoting relationships, restorative practice, all those things which contribute to good mental health. So I think this is where if you do have a mental health strategy, which as Hayden says, you know, is truly partnership based, mm. um, it, it really helps because you know we've, we've for a long time been arguing in Portsmouth for a very, very broad approach to mental health strategy. We don't see it as a CAMS strategy. Yeah. CAMS is one line among the 11, <coughs> as it were. So um, that it was really great that the inspectors shared our perspective on that. Yeah, they did. It was very impressive. That was really and, uh, reassuring. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I mean, one of the things that also work, they, they spend quite a lot of time with the yachts, the youth vending team. We haven't probably mm. mentioned them enough. Mm. Um, so our yacht manager, we've got an outstanding yacht manager here, and 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 she was engaged throughout the inspection. Um, we we have a cams worker in the yachts, co-located within the yacht, and I have to say that was very very helpful um, in terms of being able to show really really tight mental health strategies around those individual young offenders. That was really strong. And they were also interested in the fact that we got a speech and language therapist in the yacht. Yes, they were. Yeah. 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 And, and we, are, we were in, in the process of recruiting a new person to the yacht team, but we covered it with backfill, and they were also very impressed by that. So somebody on the back is covering the yacht service whilst we are waiting for the new person to start, and they said lots of services aren't able to provide that, so they were also very impressed by that. One of the things I have not mentioned, colleagues, is um, the selection of the children is a very, is a very narrow age band. So when they select the deep dive children, they, weren't, they didn't really talk a lot about primary age children and we didn't have to have any conversations, probably, probably unfortunately, because certainly mm -hmm. Alison's very passionate about this, which is the 18 to 25 mm -hmm. age group. They weren't interested in transition issues at all or 18 to 25 mental health more broadly. We kind of wish they were actually because it would help with some funding conversations yeah. we've got coming forward. Mm -hmm. um, but actually the selection of the children, I, th I think it's 10 to 14 years old. It's a very narrow age band that they're looking at. Uh, which meant they they only visited secondary schools. I, I don't know. I think it's not. Sorry. It's, yes, it is ten to forty. So they did they did visit a couple of primary schools for some 
year six youngsters in the deep dive uh, sample, but it's quite a narrow age band that they look at in this particular inspection. That that, that was quite surprising for us. Mm, that is surprising. So, I mean, part of what you've described is the real importance of relationship-based practice, our strength of relationship at senior leadership level, that as a coherent framework for your frontline as well. And that encompassing partners like the police, who we work with so closely for safeguarding, etc., uh, yep. but may not think of as an obvious partner for mental health inspection in oh, the same way. Right. Um, right. And the, the interface between mental health and safeguarding, which we've known is so important and have spent two years talking about very robustly, uh, is directly relevant to this. So that's really encouraging in terms of all the work we've been doing, isn't it, together? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely is. I mean, sometimes you feel inspectors, can, some of them can be a little bit of out of touch and not necessarily in the front of practice, but actually yes. these guys really were. They really were. Yeah, they were very impressive. That's really good. Um, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, uh, Dorset, Sussex, any questions from, from you? Um, I think my reply layer from Oxfordshire, I think my sort of takeaway is that it looks like this inspection is really about testing future in mind and how we are delivering that um, as a system and particularly with the most complex children in mind so it's kind of yeah. that link between five-year forward view and the uh, long-term plan in the NHS and how that plays itself out across the system. Yes no, I think that's a good reflection. And also, you know, trying to understand future in mind and that five-year full view as, as not just an NHS strategy, um, yeah. and trying to understand that as a system-wide strategy. You know, so, Alison's mentioned, we, we, we've been doing quite a lot of work on, on mental health support for children within a school environment. Yes. Um, and, you know, we've had a number of conversations. We, I, I, the NHS locally absolutely gets this, that mental health is everybody's business. Um, I'm not quite convinced the five-year four of you does, um, but the role of local authorities and the role of the police and the role of the yacht, you know, it is a partnership game, this. And we often say that, you know, mental health support is kind of where safeguarding was 10 years ago, where there was still well, maybe 15 years ago, where people still thought that safeguarding was just the job of the social worker. We, we've, as a system, we've cracked the back of that. We, we probably haven't quite got there with mental health yet, but we can absolutely see things like um, Future in Mind, things like this inspection framework do show there's a kind of much more system-wide approach to how do we meet the mm. mental health needs of our children. Uh, mental health support teams in the schools is a cracking example of that, of course. Just in terms of preparing some of our partners who may not have read Future in Mind, as a document and strategy, I think it's interesting they want frontline staff to know about these, and you know, personally I couldn't agree more actually. Um, are those documents that we, you know, at this point would, would start encouraging all agencies very actively to be fully aware of? Probably, yeah. Whether they need to be aware of that, it's probably the, the local translation of that is probably the more important bit. Um, so what does that mean for your local area? And for us, that resolves itself into our, our social, emotional, mental health strategy. So. Um, I'm happy to be challenged on this, Andrea, but I, I think what we do in Port is that kind of captures our local translation mm -hmm. of the NHS national strategy, if I can call it that, around mental health. And of course, trying to kind of uh, segue that with work we're doing on school exclusions and school attendance and some of the other things that we want to uh, do further work on in, in, in Portsmouth. So um, I, I, certainly when we when we have our, our, our test of, about our LTP, uh, with Andrea and colleagues, you know, we 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 put in front of them our SMH strategy because that's the translation locally of of the national strategy, but not only that national strategy. Does that make sense? And, and I yeah. would say yeah. that this this isn't really a quick fix. I think you need to if if you're thinking how do you engage frontline staff from partners who um, you don't feel are familiar with these strategies. It, this is quite. Um, this is a long-term project, really. I mean, we were lucky that in 2015-16, oh, the local C the, the Portsmouth CCG had actually, as part of its Future in Mind transformation program, had got a, a, a senko from our largest secondary school, seconded for a day a week for a year to write a strategy on emotional well-being in education. Um, we've had conferences on emotional well-being and education. It's been a huge part of our education strategy since 2016. So, you know, it's it's about building, layering um, mm -hmm. year by year 
to to get the to a wider yeah. reach for your mental health yeah. message. Yeah. I think I think the other thing. Short, short, short. Be careful, kind of move into boast mode. Don't no, we? But, no, don't. but one of the things that um, the inspectors were impressed at, not not only CAMS itself and Sonia and team, absolutely wowed. Um, I think we had a quote from an inspector saying, "If my child was poorly, this is the service that I would want them to to, to, to have," which was mm -hmm. really lovely to hear. But it's we, we've got this model in Ports of what we call team around the worker. Um, uh, so rather than referring on to services, how do you receive uh, really sophisticated support for your established relationships without a referral to CAMS, for example? CAMS workers always come out really high in the list of people that professionals want to talk to alongside social workers because you know mental health can be quite frightening when you're a practitioner in a school working with a, a young man or a young woman that's distressed and you kind of want a CAMS worker next to you to kind of make sure you're doing the right stuff. Now, what we've got in Portsmouth is, is a CAM service that's that's threaded through mm -hmm. social work, threaded through education, threaded through the yacht, and, and that, that helped enormously. It wasn't just this kind of clinical standalone service that you referred to and added to a longer waiting list. It, it's, a, it's a service that's threaded through the system, and, and that, that really helped us in this inspection because they could really see that we were deploying mental health expertise across the system, not just... Um, making sure that we've got a good, tidy, clinical, building-based service. Yeah. So, colleagues, I know a, a number of you have looked at Portsmouth SEMH strategy, which is like a local transformation plan with bells and whistles on, really. It's superb. Um, and I know that some of you looked at it quite carefully as you've developed your own LTPs. Um, I would encourage you to do that again, because it is about a whole system response to emotional health uh, and mental health service delivery and holistic care of children and care of staff as they work alongside children in distress. Um, that's an excellent example. Um, so do have a look at it um, and don't uh, panic if you find yourself in a place uh, where you think we haven't got something like this uh, to offer inspectors if they roll up at our door. No, you don't, but you do have an equivalent and you can describe the journey that you want to go on. Uh, and I think what Portsmouth have described very well is we knew ourselves. We knew yeah. where our risks were. We knew where we wanted to be doing better or more. But we also weren't afraid to say we're passionate about our children and this is what mm. good looks like. And this is the difference that we know that we're making, even if that meant asking ourselves some kind of interesting and new questions, describing the difference, the impact, as we kind of keep saying, is, is absolutely crucial. It is. And I, I should say, um, Andrea, you know, when you read the report, uh, there, there's, there's some stuff in it that we have to think about. You know, there's, yeah. there's definitely lessons for us. You know, this is not a, a, an unmitigated uh, yeah. description of complete nirvana yeah. or anything like that. Always more to do. Yes. Uh, so, are there any more questions for colleagues in Portsmouth? OK, so look, if other things occur to you, please do email Hayley Wall. Thank you, Hayley, um, for being the point of contact. We're most grateful. Um, and we've sorry, agreed... I've thought of a question. May I ask a question? Sorry, sir. Of course. Um, uh, I was wondering whether there's any rhyme or reason as to when the next inspection is be. And, you know, is this something that we it could happen to any of us? in the next six months or is it something that you need to think about over a five-year uh, window yeah so there so what what my understanding is this is that um there are jti themes so it's, they're currently on mental health they've done intrafamilial sexual abuse they've done neglect they've done domestic abuse um the, the next one that's hovering over the horizon we understand to be early health theme the framework for that has not been published um, around about 8 to 12 local areas are inspected under each theme. So we, we know that we've been done. We know Milton Keynes, and there's one in the north, and I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Sefton, that's it. Um, uh, so I know, I know of three. So Plymouth, right? So there, there could, you could still be called. Could be called tomorrow. Um, they will then move on. <laughs> Sorry to make you sleep this night. Um, they will move on to their next theme. Um, probably in the next two to three months, which we understand to be early help. But you will still... That's very helpful. 
So we, we, we have to remember that early help is not just about child protection. Early help, uh, they will still pick up on mental health services. So if you if, you, if you're from uh, mental health services, you won't necessarily escape that. And again, it's this broad. The, the, in, the 22 inspection criteria for your front door would still be applied regardless of the theme, whether the theme is early help, mental health, domestic abuse, whatever it is. Um, so one of the reasons that we got the JTIs is on the back of our ILAX inspection. So we knew we were going to have a short inspection, uh, sorry, a focused visit around a particular aspect of child protection, or we were going to get a JTI. We just happened to get the JTI. Um, yeah. which, was, which is interesting. Um, so just because we're a good authority area for safeguarding and for SCND, didn't we, we thought we'd escaped the JTI, but clearly not. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you very uh, much. Thank you. So the takeaway from that is um, no matter what theme JTI uh, you're going to be asked about, and it could be that you get the full mental health JTI, um, mental health and emotional well-being is absolutely, we are yeah. very clear in our discussions with Ofsted and CQC, it's the golden thread, uh, just as safeguarding is that we'll cut through all of those inspection frameworks. And, and you'll still get so that's really CQC helpful. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yes, indeed. And I'm on mute. Uh, okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, so um, hello. is that somebody there? Yeah, hello. I would like, my name is Ramat. I would like to ask one question regarding the, any resilience, was there any uh, hidden, would, have you seen any time in your inspection that uh, the, the inspectors were trying to check any resilience of the system? Oh, I think I think that's probably a running theme actually through the whole for the whole uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, what 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 we know, I, I could I couldn't possibly comment around CQC or HMRP. What I know about Ofsted is that um, they are not interested in resource questions. So in in the old days, Ofsted would always have a kind of value for money judgment. Um, so when the, when they were talking about commissioning, they, they rarely talked about money. They were more about integrated commissioning and joined up commissioning. They weren't necessarily talking about either, either the financial sustainability or resilience of services. I, I suppose I, they might have had a different conversation with us had our waiting times for mental health services been longer. Um, so uh, certainly in, in terms of the resilience of the mental health system, that wasn't a massive issue for us because our waiting times are, are they're, they're not perfect, but they're not bad, or they're better than many areas. Um, but they weren't really talking, they certainly don't get into any conversations around resourcing or the financial resilience. So, for, you know, for all they know, we could be taking 15 million out of the service the day they leave. They, they didn't even, they, they were, they're not interested in those questions. They were interested in um, vacancies and uh, yes, staffing. That's true. Uh, they were very interested in, you know, staff shortages and issues, and they identified uh, fairly quickly in Portsmouth correctly that actually we do have an issue of. Um, needing more, more more people with mental health expertise um, across the system, uh, and they they picked it up in in the report. But what they then um, put against that was that they felt that there was a lot of imagination being applied as to how the uh, the, the problems could be sorted differently. You know what what we could do other than the sort of conventional response. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, resilience of workforce in terms of vacancy management yeah. was a key theme. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I can understand that uh, the workforce related to mental health can't be, you know, produced very soon. It takes time, you know, and the floodgates. Thank you. If anybody's got a magic wand on that, it'd be good to have it. It's <laughs> a really good question. I think it would. Yes. Thank you. So thank you. So what what I'd suggest, colleagues, is if you've got any other questions, please do email Haley Wall, and we will um, work with colleagues here in Portsmouth to get some answers to those questions, and we'll circulate them as FAQs, frequently asked questions. Uh, key points to remind ourselves of: be prepared, have a look at that self-assessment framework, both the front door and the mental health framework. Think about where are we? Um, that's a good piece of work to do, generally, isn't it? Um, think about the agility and readiness of your multi-agency audit framework and your ability to respond as leaders um, and operational managers to that. Briefings for frontline multi-agency staff matter. 
Are we clear on our practice framework? Are we clear on our key priorities and where we're going? Um, think about the risks, know your system well, be clear about the things you want to change and improve, but don't stop talking about the things that you're really proud of, the difference that you've made to children um, and the impact on outcomes for them. And let's not underestimate the scale of this. Uh, 250 colleagues involved across all of those services from acute to criminal justice, as well as our core um, early help, social care and mental health workforce. So it's huge, isn't it? Um, uh, Hayden and Alison and Sonia, thank you so much for taking the time um, to share your knowledge, skills and experience so honestly. We have recorded this session, so um, if you know, oh there's somebody who should have been on this call with me uh, should have heard all of this um, the lovely Hayley will uh, tell us how how to get hold of that recording um, and I know there's all kinds of people that would like to listen to it okay thank you everybody and have a lovely evening thanks Andrew. Bye, Andrew. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much it's really helpful thanks thank you thank you bye, thank you. bye. 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 bye.